Hey, good morning, everyone. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. I have some water here. I brought my lunch just in case the sermon goes long. (laughs) Nervous laughter. I wasn't joking. Hey, I really am so excited, honored, and privileged to join you again, especially as we're launching this three weeks of celebration of hope. Uh, Your leaders have invited me to obviously be teaching from Scripture, but also to share a little bit of my testimony as well. And then as part of that testimony, I get to share a little bit about the work that we do with an organization called One Day's Wages. Now, I want you to know this is not an agenda to kind of advertise about One Day's Wages. The majority of the stories that I'll be sharing today comes from the work that we do. And so for whatever reason, if it resonates or it interests you in some way, I would love to encourage you at the leisure of your own home to check out uh, our website, One Day's Wages is a grassroots movement of people, stories, and actions to fight global poverty. The URL simply is onedayswages.org. All right. If you have your Bibles with you, can you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9? John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. Now, By now, you should be somewhat familiar with the story if Willow is your home church. You've been uh, going through this journey through John. Uh, I know that there was a Sunday a couple months ago when one of your guest preachers also talked about this. But because you're familiar with this, I thought it would be good for us to revisit this one more time to kind of get a glimpse of the compassionate hopeful heart, the kingdom of God that Jesus is teaching about. Listen now for the word of God. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? There's a question that I want to wrestle together this morning, and it's this simple question. If we're honest, this is the question that many of us wrestle with. After all the rah-rahs and patting ourselves on the back in the face of so much injustice and brokenness in our cities, in our nation, around the world, we might be asking the question, maybe in our own hearts, I don't know about you, but I tend to be skeptical. I tend to be cynical. And there's a voice in my mind that simply says, come on, seriously, what can one person do? And maybe we get discouraged. And as a result, we tend to grow not just skeptical or cynical, but then we become apathetic as well. One of the best definitions of hope that I've ever encountered in my years as a pastor, a leader, or as a follower of Jesus was written in a book entitled Theology of Hope. And it was written by a German theologian by the name of Jürgen Moltmann. And in this book, this is how he defines hope. Listen, 
He says, quote, genuine hope is not blind optimism. It is hope with open eyes which sees the suffering and yet believes in the future. I don't know about you, but I love that definition because it acknowledges and urges Christians, all of us, to be aware of the things that are going on in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our nation and around the world. This kind of hope that we're celebrating is not some kind of a fake, not some kind of a false emotional, not some kind of a sentimental sense of hope, but it's a hope that's brave and courageous and enduring, and it's a hope that is rooted in Jesus Christ. Some of you might be asking the question, in our culture of 24 hours, seven days a week news, constantly bombarded by bad news, by atrocities, by evil, by injustice, some of you might be asking the question, how do we wrap our minds around so much brokenness in the world. It's true. You don't have to look very far to realize some of the bad news that exists in our world. We live in our world even today where approximately 1.2 billion people survive in what development workers call extreme poverty. People that survive on less than $1.90 a day. Today, as we speak, approximately 30 to 36 million human beings, men, women, and children are caught in forced labor and slavery, including sex trafficking. We live in a world today where approximately 660 million people don't have access to clean water. It's so simple and easy for you and I we can simply turn on our tap water, go to a store and purchase water. 660 million people. In our world today, 805 million people don't have enough food to eat. But it's not just over there. In our own cities, in our own nation, we're told by experts that one in seven people in the United States face hunger every year, including one out of every five children encounter food insecurity, food hunger in our nation. And the list goes on and on. So how is it that you wrap your mind around so much brokenness and injustice and suffering in the world? It's not the complete answer, but I would submit to you one of the most important things that we can do is that we begin with our hearts. We care. We choose to care. We choose to learn and be aware. We choose to pray for the suffering and the brokenness and the injustice in the world. Yes, we should pray, God, would you give my heart joy for the things that give you joy? But we should also pray, would you break my heart for the things that break your heart as well? This is why when I read this passage, I'm so compelled by Jesus Christ. Listen to verse five. Verse five reads, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? When you read other translations of verse five, it actually specifically cites that Jesus seeing the crowd was moved by compassion. When you read the gospels, that's a very common story. When he meets with individuals, including those who are vulnerable, marginalized, forgotten, when he's teaching in front of hundreds or thousands of people, our gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they go out of their way to tell us 
that Jesus was moved by compassion, that he cared for these people. And when we say moved by compassion, Jesus didn't just care about teaching good Bible lessons. He was also caring about the whole person, about the flourishing of each person. As the crowd comes towards him, the Bible tells us 5,000 men were present. If you were to include women and children, sadly during that time, women and children were not considered as equal as men, were not counted. The Bible scholars tell us that if you were to count everybody, anywhere from 10 to 12,000 people were present. Jesus, seeing them, has compassion and thus he cares not just about his teaching to feed their spiritual lives, but he also cares about their hunger. He cares about their bodies as well. I love how Jesus with women, with children, with the Samaritan, with the tax collector, with that woman at the well, with the paralyzed, Jesus sees them and has compassion for them. Why? Because one of the most important things that you and I have to keep reminding ourselves again and again is that every single human being is created in the beautiful image of God. When Jesus says to love your neighbor, he's not just talking about neighbors that look like you, think like you, feel like you, worship like you, or vote like you. When he says love your neighbor, he's saying love everybody always. <laughs> Don't forget this. I think about his engagement, for example, with those who were suffering from leprosy, that skin disease. The Bible in Leviticus, actually, there's a Levitical law that gave instructions to those who were struggling with leprosy how they had to act. For example, Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45. This is wild. It says, the leper in whom the plague is, shall wear torn clothes, and the hair of his head shall hang loose. He shall cover his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. So let me explain to you what that looks like. If I'm a leper, and I had the audacity to leave my enclave of other lepers and enter a public place, the Levitical law tells me I had to wear ripped clothes, long unkept hair, so that people could identify me. I had to cover my mouth to prevent spreading of germs. And then I had to scream at the top of my lungs, unclean, unclean leper walking through. Why? So that people could scurry and hide. And that's what they did. They would scurry away from the leper. Which is why it's so powerful that Jesus, instead of hiding, he goes. He approaches. He encounters. He reaches out. He extends mercy, compassion, hope, and love. And this is why as a charge, as instructions for us as Christians, the instruction for the church is not to hide in the name of Jesus. The instruction is not to be safe in the name of Jesus. The instruction is not to hunker down and go in preservation mode to protect ourselves from the dangerous world in the name of Jesus. The instruction the theme today is to go. So what does go mean for us? Man, I'm so grateful that go means different things for different people because the Holy Spirit is alive and working in all of our lives. But we have to listen. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about our family's journey. 
And I pray that you would receive it with grace. It's not my intent or desire to show off and share with you, but to give God glory. About 12 years ago, I had a chance to visit a country called Burma, otherwise known as Myanmar. And I had a chance to visit a jungle, a classroom in the jungles in Burma, visiting a particular ethnic group of people called the Karin people. They were experiencing what development experts call a genocide. There was a military government that was after their very lives. Their village didn't have a name because they constantly move from place to place. Now, I need you to use your imagination. I want you to use a portion of the stage as a makeshift classroom. It's a classroom for first to fifth graders. 20 tables, 20 chairs, nothing is matching. On the side of the classroom is a greenish, grayish, overused, scarred chalkboard. And on that chalkboard is a poster approximately this size. I walked into this classroom and the first thing my eyes went to was this poster. It was a collage of photos taped together. Now I want to be really sensitive here to children that might be present. It was a collage of photos of men, women, and children and missing body parts. And I saw this, and I'm not an education expert, but clearly I said to myself, that does not seem appropriate for a classroom. My host, sensing that I was stirred and disrupted, actually tells me in his broken English to come closer, Reverend Cho, Reverend Cho, come closer. And he points to the bottom row and there are these grayish metallic contraptions. And then he says to me, these are landmines. We must teach children avoid landmines. That day I met some of the survivors of these landmines, including children. I also met a particular family in this village. And this gentleman is one of the elders, one of the leaders. He's, this is a, a Christian family. 50% of that village were followers of Jesus. I asked this man, I said, uh, sir, what's challenging in your village? This man, knowing that I had just visited a classroom, he said to me, again in his broken English, he says, a paying teacher's salaries hard. Now, I was there with other pastors to learn, to investigate, to research, so I had to ask the question, well, how much are their salaries? He sticks out four fingers and he says, $40 U.S. So I instantaneously, in my naivete, said, uh, per day. And he laughed, just like some of you just laughed. He shook his head. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. Did you mean $40 a week? He shakes his head again. I was so embarrassed. So I said, I'm so sorry. Did you mean $40 a month? This time, his face turns very stoic. I think he's annoyed by me. And he just says, no, $40 per year. Now, I share that not to make you feel guilty, but part of the work that we do with genuine hope is to be truth tellers, to convey the injustice, the brokenness, the evil that exists in our world. And so I was wrestling with this experience and I kept coming back to this question, what can one person do? I shared this experience with my wife and children. I thought I would share with you a picture of us years ago after this trip. This is my family. We look this good all the time. It's not even photoshopped. Asian jeans, baby. Notice how like you laugh and all the Asians are like, mm-hmm. 
So my wife and I began to wrestle with this experience. What, what should we do? Now, this is how the Holy Spirit began to stir in us. And this is where I need your grace. After praying and fasting, the Holy Spirit begins to convict our family to give up our year's wages. Now, I don't know about you, we don't have a year's wages stored under our mattress. So we go on a journey of three years of saving and simplifying and selling things that we did not need. During this time, I learned that my one year's wages, $68,000, produces a one day's wages of $287. Now, let's be honest. Maybe in our economy, it doesn't buy hardly a gadget. But did you know that $287, I learned, has the capacity to purchase 27 malaria nets, send six kids to school for one year, help two or three women that have experienced gender violence receive counseling and job training skills, helps 270 people receive clean water for approximately one year. It allows for 2,700 trees to be planted. Verse 7 in our Bible passage, this is Philip's version of this question. In verse 7, it says this, Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. This is Philip's version of trying to be respectful to Jesus for asking what he thinks is a ridiculous, dumb question. I almost imagine Philip saying, hello, McFly, for you 80 cultures people. And he tells Jesus, look at the crowd. Are you insane? Half a year's wages. So in our economy, approximately $25,000 would only provide just small portions for each person to have a bite. But friends, this is really where the rubber meets the road. I'm asking this question, some of you are asking this question, and I would submit to you, we are asking the wrong question. We're asking a question that centers me as the primary character. You matter, but you're not the most important portion in the economy of God. We have me and here's God. Do you see that little dot? That's God. And we're saying, oh, what can one person do? How about if we reverse this? Here's the question we should be asking. Let me correct this, if I may. Um, red ink, nope. What can God do with, don't worry so much about other people. How is God speaking to you? What can God do with me? That's the question we should be asking. Don't underestimate God. God is amazing. God is gracious. God is merciful. God is awesome. God can do all things. Don't forget this. We had no idea, and I share this as a reflection of God's amazing power that in giving our $68,000 in nine years, we've had approximately 12,000 people in over 40 countries give their one day's wages, donate their birthdays, give $10, give $5. But in the last nine years, we've raised approximately $7.5 million to help those living in extreme poverty. But you see, it's not about numbers, it's about changed lives. For example, 
This young man, his name is Ho Van Lai. Ho Van Lai was 10 years old when he was walking to school with his cousins and they stepped on a landmine. Two of his cousins were immediately killed, sadly. For Hovan, he lost his right hand, right leg, left foot, one eye, has partial vision in his remaining eye. And so with some of our partners on the ground in Vietnam, we were able to provide 400 scholarships for children coming from families affected by the aftermath of the Vietnam War. I'm happy to share that Hovan just recently passed the entrance exam to enter into high school. Or well, the story about this father and husband named Monday. Monday was named Monday by his parents because, yes, your guess is right, he was born on a Monday. <laughs> now, he lives in a small little village in Uganda. They had a water well that was functioning, but guess what happened? The water well broke. And sometimes you may have good intentions, but bad process or bad methodology, they never really trained anyone in that village how to maintain that water well. Did you know that one out of every three water wells in sub-Saharan Africa are broken right now? So this man, Monday, was so moved by this because people no longer were able to go to the water well. They went back to the old contaminated water source. It also had dangers. In fact, there were a couple young children that drowned and died in that water well. He took it personally and he vowed, I want to become a water mechanic, a water well technician, and with our partnership with an organization called the Adventure Project, we were able to train women and men to become water engineers, water technicians in their own village. Or how about the beautiful story about 270 women that we were able to come alongside through our partners called Create in Senegal. And I love this picture because I don't have the time to go into all the depths of this story, but there's something so beautiful when you're able to come alongside women and men and children, but especially women, and you somehow help them to realize they have a voice, they have dignity, they have entrepreneurship, they have skills, they're able to save, they're able to start their own businesses and it was amazing to see these women lift their own families out of poverty. Listen to what it says here in verse nine. In verse nine of our passage, it simply reads this. Philip says, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. Now, I want you to realize, I've had the privilege of going to the Holy Lands on three occasions. It's beautiful. It's amazing. When I read this story, one of my first skeptical questions is, how is it possible that Jesus was preaching and being heard by 12,000 people? There's actually places in the Holy Lands amazing acoustics that you can be teaching by a hillside and not even be screaming or shouting and it just reverberates through the valley. That's what I'm picturing here. In fact, when Jesus first asks the question, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? I'm convinced as someone that studies scripture I'm convinced that the majority of that crowd of people heard that question and they turned away. Now, what do I mean they turned away? Sometimes when there's a question or a challenge that convicts us, either we respond or we turn away. As a pastor, I've asked in my own church, who here wants to volunteer to clean our bathrooms and toilets? And it's amazing, a lot of people turn away. In my own family, after having supper with our three teenage kids, my wife and I will say, hey kids, who here wants to volunteer to do dishes? They just look away. 
my wife and I look at each other and go, don't they know that we still see them? <laughs> These fools. Now watch, this is really important. I believe when Jesus says, where shall we get food for these people to eat? Out of that sea of people, a young boy emerges. More specifically, he was a young poor boy because the bread that he has in his lunch bag is made out of something called krithinos in Greek which was bread specifically consumed by poor people because it was so cheap. This young boy hears the question, and here's the thing. Back in the time of Jesus, there weren't grocery stores in every other street. In my home in Seattle, in our one mile radius, we have seven huge grocery stores. We have a Trader Joe's, we have a Whole Foods, a Safeway, and the list goes on and on. So during the time of Jesus, when people needed to go on a long day's journey, it was very typical for them to prepare a small sack of food because they had no idea what the day would hold and they would simply tie it next to their clothes, hidden in this fashion. And so when Jesus says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? This young boy looks around, moved, compelled, inspired, and he goes. He works through the crowd, hundreds, maybe thousands. He's working, worming somehow, trying to get to Jesus. Listen. There's no way that you can interpret this as the disciples muscling this young boy, give us your food. (laughs) He is moved by Jesus, and I imagine this young boy going to Jesus and saying, "Um, Jesus, sir, uh, Jesus, um, it's not much. It's not much. My supper is your supper. What can God do with me? That's the power of the gospel. Man, so many crazy stories. For example, you know, years ago when I spoke at Willow, I met a young mother of two children. Her name was Angie. And she came up and she was so moved by our desire to fight global poverty. She said, I have an idea. I want to shave my head to raise awareness and raise money for a famine that was going on in East Africa. And she shaves her head and raises over $10,000. I see a lot of women with hair right now. May you be convicted. (laughs) True story, first service this morning, a young woman comes up, signs up to shave her head. Crazy. Or the story, for example, of a young 16-year-old boy named Wiley Mao who bicycles over 3,100 miles across the United States to raise awareness and resources to help people with clean water. One of my favorite stories are three men, three college students that I recently met in Minnesota. Did I butcher that? I did. Okay, never mind. The Bartz brothers, they build snow sculptures that's slightly better than yours. Here it is. And they've been doing this now for nine years. And this has been so fascinating to people. NBC Nightly News share their story of what they did and why they do what they did. In the last three years, they've raised nearly $90,000. I'm inspired by the story of a young 10-year-old girl named Hannah who sent us this beautiful note with her $14 donation. What 
can God do with and through me? One of my favorite quotes comes from a pastor that you're very familiar with. Many folks don't know he's a pastor. He did a TV show called Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And in one of his stories, talking about danger and injustice and evil around the world, he says this quote, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers you will always find people who are helping. I love that quote. It's given me encouragement, but I wanna add one thing to that quote. Don't just look for the helpers. Jesus is calling us to go and be the helpers ourselves. It may mean that we go to Burma and Myanmar, but sometimes the scariest place to go, let's be honest, is across the street to our neighbors that we've awkwardly waved at for the last four years. How is God calling you to go? Don't just look. Don't just be bystanders. Go and be that person unto others. When I look back at my own personal family story, man, I'm inspired by men and women that went and made a difference in our family's life. For example, my great-grandparents were some of the first people in their village outside of a city called Pyongyang to say yes to Jesus. They said yes because they met these missionaries that came not only with the Bible, but they helped provide medical care help build schools, invest in education. They were out on the streets fighting for justice and the list goes on. They saw these helpers and they said yes to Jesus. My parents were both very, very poor growing up. My father, who's 82 years old, he spent time, for example, in a United Nations refugee camp separated by his own family. He told me this only recently last year. One of the most graphic stories he shared with me is that when he was a young boy, he was so hungry and there was such deep hunger pangs. There were days, moments when he would take grass, pull it out of the ground and he would consume it to somehow satisfy the hunger pangs. But you know what he tells me? He says he kept seeing Christians who were there to help with food and resources. He actually remembers seeing someone by the name of Bob Pierce, who eventually founded an organization called World Vision. I'm inspired by these stories. In the last couple of years, I've been visiting numerous countries, again, for one day's wages. And particularly, I visited several Muslim nations, Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan. And what's been fascinating is that in these trips, I've had the privilege of meeting a handful of Muslims who since profess and worship Jesus Christ. Now, that's so interesting to me. So I've asked them the question, why did you choose to say yes to Jesus? This is what I heard. Some of them said, well, when we crossed the borders, dangerous path, we met some Christians who were there to welcome us and help. When we got on the boat, some Christians were there to hand us supplies and water vests. When we got off the boat, some Christians were there to hand us food and dry clothes and other resources to welcome us and hug us. I'll never forget this one quote. This man said to me, I became a Christian because Christians kept being there to help. What a powerful witness for the glory of Jesus Christ. We're not always sure how God's gonna use us, but do not underestimate what God can do through me, through you. Don't just look, friends. Don't just look. 
Go. Be the helpers. Go and be the helpers. So Father, we thank you again for this amazing invitation that you give to us. We come saying, my supper is your supper. Help us to go. Be the helpers for your glory and honor and all God's people said, amen.